Welcome. Today we're going to talk about teaching and learning mathematics. We're going to look at it through two different lenses. Math as a set of skills and math as a schema. And don't worry if you're not too familiar with the word schema. We'll kind of define that as we go. But first, let's ask a question. What if math could be taught the way the brain learns? Now, maybe you're thinking, surely we do that already. We have standards that list all the things we need to teach. We clearly explain everything in the list. Then we give students time to practice. So let's see how that's working out. This remarkable math question was on a national assessment a few years ago, and what's so interesting about this particular question is how badly students performed. About two out of every three students got this wrong, and not students in fifth grade, where fraction addition might actually be taught, but students in eighth grade and twelfth grade. Only one in three got it correct. The problem is that students had been taught this as a skill, a procedure that looked something like this which may or may not have actually involved a butterfly, but either way, it was taught as a skill. And one that at the time, probably significantly large numbers of students tested proficient. But on this question, even if you perform the skill correctly, the output doesn't look like any of the answer choices, because the question is not asking about fractions as a skill. It's going deeper to see if students have a schema for fractions? Do they conceptually understand what a fraction actually means? That 7 over 8 means you take a unit, break it into 8 parts, and keep 7 of them. Similarly, 12 over 13 means break a unit into 13 parts and keep 12 of those, each of which produces objects that are about 1, and 1 plus 1 is 2. So when math is taught as a set of skills, the majority of students don't develop much of a schema or conceptual understanding of mathematics. The reason is that while it's so tempting to think of math as a list of skills to be learned and practiced to fluency, this one-dimensional approach bears little resemblance to the way the brain actually stores and uses information. Our brains take ideas and build connected schema, the connections between ideas allowing us to build bigger and more powerful schema, and the more connections, the deeper the conceptual understanding. And it's perfectly possible to engage students in learning in a way that matches the brain's learning processes and will lead to students building a deep mathematical schema, a rich connected web of ideas that they can use to think critically and creatively and solve challenging problems and thus be prepared for the 21st century. So how can we do that? Let's play a game. You can scan the QR code using a phone or tablet, or type the URL in a browser. Let's pause this video to give you time to play. Let's take a look at what you did. First things first, notice I didn't show you how the game worked, and there are no instructions. You had to figure it out by yourself. This is intentional. This is an incredibly powerful part of the learning process, activating some of the brain's fundamental learning mechanisms and enabling you as a student to build your own understanding or schema of how this works. And because you built it yourself, it will stick. In the first puzzle, you drag the blobs onto the number line and you likely saw the stick flip over and skip count its way down the number line, hitting each of the blobs. Next, we had a puzzle that was skip counting by twos, but didn't start at zero. Then the third puzzle introduced a new idea. The blobs are numbered. Maybe you didn't notice at first and put the one numbered five here, but then from the formative feedback, you realized what was needed and made the adjustment. This is learning by doing, learning from mistakes, and all of your students are capable of doing this. It's also fun. Then in the fourth puzzle, I really changed it up, and you probably dragged the blob, skip counting your way down the number line, and eventually settled on 19. Excellent. Now comes the really interesting question, and we're going to pause again, but this time you'll discuss, without using academic language, how did you solve this puzzle? And by no academic language, I just mean don't use words that a second or third grader wouldn't be comfortable with. I want your explanations, not a set of technical phrases. Let's pause the video and discuss. I hope you had a great discussion and saw a variety of methods and solution paths. Also notice that by specifically not allowing academic language, it actually makes the conversation richer. The purpose of discourse is to push students to justify and explain their ideas, which helps them solidify their understanding and to make connections, not to just learn vocabulary. 
Maybe you had a similar explanation to my son, who's 10 and in fourth grade. Two will be at 12, three at 17, four at 22, five at 25. No, that's not right. I went wrong in my head. Five will be at 27, six at 32, seven at 37, eight at 42, and nine at 47. Is that right? And of course, I never answer whether it's right or not. I just said, hey, let's try it and see. So let's examine that for a moment, because something really important is happening here. Obviously, he can no longer use the strategy that's been successful so far. He can't actually see where this will end up. So here, he's using spatial temporal reasoning, the ability to create a movie in your mind of what will happen in order to predict what the outcome will be. ST math, spatial temporal math. This is fundamentally how students learn to solve problems. Yes, in ST math, they build the skills. Yes, in ST math, they build conceptual understanding. But also in ST math, they learn how to solve problems. Productive struggle, creative thinking, spatial temporal reasoning. And these skills are transferable onto new math or anything else in or out of the mathematics classroom. Now, let's look at an explanation from an older student. The stick is five spaces long. It will flip to measure itself nine times from the starting point, but it starts at two, so it will get to 47. And of course, this is fabulous. Without talking about linear equations, we've built up the definition of a classic linear situation, y equals mx plus b, where m, the rate of change, is 5, x, the number of times something will happen, is 9, the offset b is 2, and the output y is 47. So now when students are solving or graphing linear equations, they have a tangible idea of what they mean. y equals 5x plus 2, right, so something that's growing by 5 every time but starts at 2, I should graph it here. And this is the type of learning experience students have with ST Math all the time. They'll solve thousands of puzzles in a grade level as they move through the mastery based system. And as teachers, you can help them to build that deep schema by engaging with them using the problem solving process. Bring ST Math games into the classroom, have them notice and wonder about what they see on the screen, have them make predictions about what they think is going to happen, test out their conjectures, observe and analyze the formative feedback. If the prediction was correct, discuss why. If the prediction didn't work, discuss what we might need to change. Then help the students connect that learning to bigger ideas. Let's look at one of the effects of this type of learning process. The accessibility for all students. Here we can see students who were assessed at being on grade level, and on average, how many times it took them to solve certain ST math games. Some games are trickier than others. But what's remarkable is that even students who were assessed at being one grade level behind were also able to achieve mastery of this on grade level content. They just needed more time. In fact, even students who were assessed at being two grade levels behind also made it through, and even students who were three grade levels behind. Now realize that most of these students would have been stuck in below grade level work in almost any other math program. But in ST Math, we can keep practically all students on grade level. And this is just one of the ways we work towards achieving our mission as a social benefit organization, to ensure that all students are mathematically equipped to solve the world's most challenging problems.